thank you for joining us. We continue to focus on uh, the repeal or the promised repeal of the three farm laws because it has been such a big and important story for us over the last one year. And uh, farmer crisis has been a story for me for the last several years. Uh, we had one very important conversation that we had put out, actually more than one, with P. Sainath of uh, Pari, which is a People's Archive of Rural India a website you must check out. Many of our viewers felt that it was a very informative conversation. So uh, we're very happy to have Mr. Sainath, who's agreed to speak to us again right now to actually unpack. Uh, this entire promise made by the Prime Minister to repeal the laws. Now, there are, uh, once the announcement was made early in the morning yesterday, we saw both uh, cabinet members of the government, spokespeople of the BJP, and mainstream anchors of news channels try and spin it into the kindness of the government's heart and the big-heartedness of uh, the Prime Minister to sort of give the farmers what they want. Is that really what happened? Within his own speech, the Prime Minister said he was unable to convince a certain section of farmers about the benefits of this law. Uh, there was some talk about an apology. Was there really an apology? Um, and was there really an attempt to hear out the concerns of the farmers and actually have a conversation with them? We'll have that conversation as well. The bigger thing to talk about is also this. These three farm laws did not address the very serious agrarian distress that our farmers are going through across the country. And this has been happening now for many, many years. What happens when these farm laws are withdrawn? Which they should have been wrong. There's a, there's a video we will provide you with a link where you can take a look at the previous conversations that I've had with Mr. Sainath, where we talk about why these, these three laws don't address the problems and what those problems are. What happens now? Is there any likelihood at all that these problems will be addressed at this point? Is the government likely to be too maybe concerned or nervous to touch agrarian crisis again in the rest of this term of theirs? What happens to the farmers? What happens to MSP? What happens to the loans? What happens to the suicides? Um, the lack of fertilizer supply that many parts of the country are also going through. We're going to talk about all of that. Uh, we're going to try and answer as many questions as we can as well from our audience that have come in. Let me first begin by uh, inviting Mr. P. Sainath, Senior Journalist, Founding Editor of the People's Archive of Rural India to this conversation. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good afternoon to you. You've put out both an article and a very interesting thread on uh, Twitter. What I found really interesting, and this is important, is, and, and I had this conversation with a couple of people last night as well, this is an example of uh, the kind of peaceful democratic protest uh, that this country is known for. Uh, these farmers were vilified, they were called names, their patriotism was questioned, their intelligence was questioned, they were beaten with lattes, they were hit with water cannons, and they continued to protest. And while most of media call this a gift, this, would you say this is less of a gift and more of a victory for our farmers? Look, the outcome of yesterday is at many important levels, a very, a very vital and vibrant victory for the farmers. It did not come out of charity from the government. There are very good compulsions for why the government acted the way it did. And um, I think this was a fantastic victory. Look at the odds that they were against. You know, from the first month they were there, I had many of those mainstream anchors ask me, how long can they hold out? You know, I mean, a couple of months and then, you know, you got to go home. They didn't count on the people of Punjab and their resilience and the people of Haryana. And they didn't at all count on thousands coming from 20 other states, at least in some symbolic presence, to sit there. Most anchors didn't, do not know that there is a camp called Shah Jahanpur, you know, on the Rajasthan-Haryana border. Now, the, the important thing is that you can see what Mr. Modi saw, what his captive mainstream media did not. He saw the real significance of the by-elections to the 29 assembly seats and the three Lok Sabha seats. And he was very clear that the worst beating the BJP had taken was in those states where the farm agitation was most intense, and that's much of the Hindi belt, 
And now that was spreading to UP, it was already entrenched in Western UP. Take, for instance, when did you last hear of even going back to the days of the Janasam or the Janta Party dominated by the RSS or the BJP? When did you ever last, when did you last hear of any of them coming third and fourth in constituencies in the state of Rajasthan? a bedrock area for them. They came third in one constituency, fourth in other. In Haryana, the entire system, as the locals say, from CM to DM, ganged up against Abhay Chautala. His brother and I mean, his cousins and his family ganged up against him. The entire cabinet of Haryana campaigned against him. Union ministers came down. Congress, of course, following the good old principle that the Congress does. When there's nothing left to do, be sure a fool will do it. Put up a candidate against a man who had quit on the farmer's issue and you should never have opposed him. Their candidate lost his deposit, I think, but took away 20,000 votes from Chautala Abe, And yet Abe Chautala won by more than 6,000 votes. That told the government something. Himachal, state with so much highly commercialized agriculture, uh, two months, two months before the voting, the Adanis offered a price for the prime variety of apple. You can read that whole story in the business standard, you know, who are by no means anti Adani or Ambani. <laughs> but um, Two months before the voting, the Adani's representatives offered the apple growers of Himachal for the prime variety eight, a price 18% less than the distress price of the pandemic year of 2020. There, there was a huge halag over it and they backtracked and some settlement was arrived at, I think. But look at this, that even though technically the Supreme Court has stayed the implementation of the farm laws, it was already at work on the ground in the market. Yeah. So you can see what will happen when that, if, if that stay was lifted, if the stay were to be lifted. Himachal, they got wiped out. Yeah. Himachal, Haryana, Rajasthan, they are very weak in Chhattisgarh now because of a strong CM there who has corralled them. And now in Western UP, the problems are showing. They haven't had a voting there. But, and Lakhimpur Keri was beginning to, the impact was beginning to spread. I'll tell you one of the least discussed things about Lakhimpur Keri. If you look at the conjunction, the prime minister made some very hawkish sounds a week before. A Supreme Court judge lashed out at the farmers, saying, you can't have it both ways, sitting there in protest and approaching the courts. They never approached the courts. It was some pro-corporate farmer association that did that. Then comes Ajay Mishra, who says, I can discipline these fellows in two days. And then the incident involving his son, for which the son is now under arrest. I am. I was very sure at that time that until Lakhimpur Kerry happened and put them on the defensive, they were moving towards a physical eviction of the camps. They were stirring it up. Because the Supreme Court had also made a statement saying they cannot block roads indefinitely. So it did seem to be heading in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, there would be an instruction to say remove and, them. And the Supreme Court never took note of the uh, argument that it was not the farmers who blocked the roads. It was the government. It was not the farmers who drug 10 feet by 10 feet trenches. It was the government, which had a mobilization there that would seem more justified on the LAC with China. You know? So... Uh, that kind of mobilization, BSF, CRPF, you name it, they were there. Barbed wire, water cannon, the whole works. The other thing which you should notice about the Supreme Court earlier when uh, 
Mr. Bobde was there. <laughs> Justice Bobde was there. You know, the when a court, a judge of the Supreme Court asks, in this protest, why are they keeping women and old people there? There you have a reflection of your society's deep-rooted misogyny and prejudice against women who you don't recognize as farmers, though 73.5% of rural women are engaged in work related to agriculture and 60% of all work done in agriculture seems to me to come from women. So um, when, you, when you have this situation and you have a judge of the Supreme Court asking, why are they, you know, the, for me, the operative were, why do they keep the women there? What does this keep mean? <laughs> what does it mean? It is so insulting and demeaning to people who hold up your agriculture, whose work keeps your labor keeps your agriculture going. So all this was building. It was building for that. And they went, you know, they enthused their troops so much that a couple of them went berserk. And that's what Lakimpur Keri was about. Incidentally, uh, in the fallout of Lakimpur Keri, the minister in question, uh, Mr. Sainat, is still a minister. The government hasn't removed him. So they haven't done that sort of acknowledgement. I mean, if we look at the last one year, for example, the removal of the health minister and the changing of the health minister was, in, was perhaps the only indication we had that the government felt that they needed, that there was, there was some level of mismanagement. But in this case, in Latin Bukhari, they haven't removed the minister in question. Not, you see, that, that, that is of a piece with what you began this program with about, you know, the discussion that took place over the prime minister's apology. Yes. There was no apology to the farmers. There was not a word in apology to the farmers. The prime minister apologized to the nation for not having been able to convince a section of farmers. No more. Now, it would have been more enlightening since it was only a section he couldn't convince. It would have been more enlightening for the prime minister to have told us of all those other sections that he had convinced. We'd like to know. We'd really like to know. And I'm sure the farmers would like to know who amongst them were convinced by him. Second, there was not a word in apology for the over 600 deaths. Not a word of sympathy that, you know, too many lives have been lost and the government will, you know, rehabilitate those families who lost breadwinners and that we will declare a compensation of so much. None of this, not a word on it, not a word in apology for the farm laws themselves. At no point was there an apology for a three laws drafted by the lawyers of the corporations in this country, yeah, which were not seen by his cabinet members until they had to go out and defend it. Yeah. Just like in demonetization, his finance minister did not know that the demonetization was on. He just, he heard it on television. Yeah. So there is not a word in apology there is a cynical statement that I could not, you know, I, I failed to convince a section of people. When did that ever stop them from pushing through actions that they failed to convince a section of people? When did they do that? And persuade, I failed to persuade. You persuade with barbed wire, water cannons. You persuade with trenches and border security force. You persuade by running a car, somebody, one of your party people runs a car, uh, uh, an SUV through a farmer's rally when there was absolutely no problem involved, no traffic issue involved, kills several of them, yeah, and then is not arrested for days and days. This was your persuasion. Your, was it your persuasion to bring the kind of pressures you did on those farmers to keep them there? In one of Delhi's worst winters in decades, a horrible summer, a miserable rainy season. And, and he says, despite best efforts to persuade, 
we could not convince that section. And if those were the best efforts, imagine what the worst ones would look like. There was also um, talk of, uh, you know, the government wanted to repeatedly speak to the farmers, that talks broke down, the farmers were not willing to listen. We know that there were exactly 11 rounds of talks. Farmers came back repeatedly saying that we're not being listened to. They're not listening to us. We've got point by point breakdown of why this doesn't work for us, but they don't seem to be listening. Then there was a uh, hollow offer of saying, we'll put it off by a year and a half, which the farmers rejected. And there is also a trust deficit now because the farmers have said that they're not going to cancel their programs until this is actually repealed in parliament. Um, would you say that this announcement feeds into that trust deficit and the government's handling of this entire protest has just been dishonest? Well, all the dishonesty behind the motives um, granted, and I take them for granted, it is still a good thing that the announcement was made. Hmm. Because now the farmers will, just like the farmers held them pinned down for a year, the farmer, these farmers are now chuffed. They will hold them to their repeal announcement. They will hold them to it. And especially with elections coming up in 90 days in five states, uh, they will really, really need to get it done in that parliament session if the government hopes to gain any benefit or rollback of the situation in Western UP. Yeah, that's, that's one thing. The second thing is this, that um, why should they trust the government? Why should anyone trust the government? Yeah. I mean, look at what happened with demonetization. Look at what's happened with fuel prices, piling them on every day. I mean, and just you don't, you don't care for what people think and what people say. So I'm very interested in why one particular section failing to be convinced triggered the compassion of the prime minister. That's, that's the second thing. The third thing is this, that the anchors that we were speaking of yes. have also spun another angle. One is the generosity, as you know, that they were in total disarray and confusion. You know, for 15 months, they have, I mean, for more than a year, they have faithfully held the front line, the battle of the front line for, the, for Mr. Modi. And suddenly, he was firing cannon behind them. You know? So, uh, but the thing is this, that they also are trying to spin it even now as, and you can look at the front pages of Express and Times, as a master stroke that alters the situation in Punjab. Because mm. they're, they're projecting Amarinder Singh as saying, see, I resigned from the Congress. I negotiated with Modi. I got these laws withdrawn. You know, there used to be a World War II saying, it came in with what else? Go tell it to the Marines. Now, you really think, I'm saying yes, sir. lots of things can happen between now and voting. But you really think the millions of people in Punjab whose hearts were with the protesters, who themselves went in cycling in cycles and came back, whose loved ones were camped there for a year and the children didn't get to see them, are they now suddenly going, do they have any doubts on whose victory it was? Do they think it was Amarinda that gave us this? I think that really the focus is on UP. It's on what they can pull back and how they can push back the Samajwadi party and others. Because the Samajwadi party now has an alliance with the Rashtriya Lokdal in Western UP. And all of this will have some implications. How it works out, we don't know. But there are also complications within complications because of the equation between Yogi Adityanath on the one hand and Modi Shah on the other. One of the interpretations UP journalists are giving me is that they felt that the BJP was winning the UP election. Ooh. Yeah, And you couldn't let the credit go for that to Adityanath. Okay, so you, you had to say, 
that this is conversely if adityanath does badly he'll say it's because you rolled back those laws and undermined our prestige but that is one and the second thing is that you know mr adityanath is very i mean he he is not concealing his ambitions of being the heir apparent to succeed mr modi now say just think of that can't make uh, um mr modi very happy no it can't make mr amit shah jump with joy right mm. it can't so you you're seeing all sorts of games un- unfolding there as well and on, on, on that point if i may um there there's more going on in western up there there is a fertilizer supply crisis from what i understand our uh, farmers aren't able to sow their next crop because there's no supply of fertilizer they're apparently going standing in lines every day and coming back empty handed uh, there's a water crisis there's a crisis of stray cattle there's uh, there are many things aggravating the agrarian distress over and above the farm laws do you expect even if the government manages to repeal in parliament which they have to table a repeal for if they manage to repeal in parliament in time is this enough though no i think that one has to recognize and accept that elections happen on many issues and there are many factors in them i think you're going to see a huge rise in communal temperature mm. you're going to see a huge rise in caste problems which have been in they are going to see a major attempt to divide the jats and the muslims who have come together for the first time after muzaffarnagar hmm. and so i think that's going to happen i think that's going to happen uh, it won't happen in a gigantic explosion in one place i think we're already seeing it happen in localized events building that tension and building that temp so there are many things that go into it there is sectarian prejudice there is caste feeling now what we are, what we are watching with this government in power is that it practices the politics of opening old wounds now it's already alienated half the southern states with yes. its return to imposition of hindi and stuff and you can see how clearly and how clearly chief minister stalin in tamil nadu perceives it and is pushing back on that um they are in a bad way in karnataka after they removed yadurappa who is not going to let them rest for his humiliation they've got problems in the south even last time they last in 2019 they had all but lost the election but won it back in the north with pulwama mm. please remember that a year earlier they had been roundly defeated in rajasthan chatisgarh madhya pradesh the thing was spreading so you had pull you know when it comes to the national polls there is always pakistan mm. that's that's uh, one thing you know you know many many decades ago when the united states and the soviet union had a detente a reporter asked the largest manufacturer of armaments in the world general dynamics he asked the vice president of general dynamics what do you guys do if there are more outbreaks of peace and i love that phrase outbreaks of peace and that guy gave a classic answer i'll never forget he said son we must have faith in the long term threat <laughs> okay sounds familiar so you you're going to see many things unfold here which will change the ax- hope attempt to change the axis on which the elections happen another thing that was a big signal for them was the up panchayats in the three tiers two tires they were routed two tiers they were routed and then violence and booth capturing ensured that they got the third tier the top tier okay so all these have led them to press panic button and this is one thing of uh, you know 
carrying the cross to the uh, of the farm laws to the elections didn't seem such a good idea because it it unsettles the state from where they have the maximum amount of political power and political representatives but you know fay let's come back to yes. let's come back to the you know the withdrawal and how is it that none of these anchors none of these when the elections take place it's going to be 22 the state assembly none of these anchors asks any government spokesperson the question guys did mr modi promise to double farmer income by 2022 when you go to the voter what are you going to say about that since you and i last had a discussion you saw again this morning the times of india in its editorials is trying to say you know you you had cosseted the rich farmer and when you suddenly walked off this is what you should have expected this is effectively what the editorial says when you and i last had a discussion i gave you what the monthly earning of a family of it was 18050 it's now 24 or 25000 for a family of 5 meaning a per capita of 5000 but more important there has been a newer survey the survey we discussed then was the national sample survey 70th round this year they released the 77th round for the year 2018-19 they changed the methodology to make things look better but still two deadly facts come through yeah now a farmer has more than one source of income the main of course should be agriculture the crop the crop income <laughs> then millions of farmers in this country do wage labor so they, there is a wage la- wage in- labor income millions of them have livestock and there is income from livestock so there are five six buckets from which their income comes whatever you do whichever way you cut it two facts even with the false methodologies they used crop income of the farmer in agriculture hmm? uh, crop income of the farmer in agriculture has dropped as a share of the total second more frightening there is an absolute decline in real income of the farmer from crop agriculture the amounts that have gone up the numbers you see which have gone up have gone up in wage labor and livestock and in wage labor please understand the implications if farmers are making more and more of their income from wage labor when you are looking at a proletarianization of the farming of the farmer and two they are competing with agricultural laborers not so great mm-hmm. but the most important thing is that there has been an absolute decline in real income of the farmer from crop agriculture against the promise of a government that said doubling of income by 2020 we don't ask mr modi these questions because he's the only man only prime minister of a democracy who has not held a press conference in the 8 years he's been around yes sir. yeah it is just you know the the thing that struck me in uh, when the afghan thing uh, unfolded was that the first thing the taliban did was to hold a press conference <laughs> and answer some tough questions and yes, answer sir. Yeah, I mean, totally hypocritical answers to certain questions, yeah. all of that. But they held a damn press conference. So that brings us actually to talk about the media, which we've talked about in the past. Uh, you've also said in the last twenty-four hours that while this is a victory for the farmers, it is. Uh, it needs to be seen as a repeated failure of media. Now we do know um, that this establishment is very good. at moving on to the next story as quickly as possible right they give you an aryan khan they give you a different story for the media to spin and distract 
they uh, I, I was told yesterday by Radhika Ramsey, who was a very senior journalist, political journalist, that the people in Uttar Pradesh have sorted have started to forget what happened during the second wave of COVID. They need to be actively reminded for them to bring it up. So between the media and the government, do you see a likelihood to move past this really quickly, bury the farm distress and create new issues? Um, and is that also a symptom of everything we're going through in this country right now, that the media doesn't argue for the people, it actually advocates for government? Well, the answer is yes and no. Do they need to move on very fast? Yes, they do. But the media are also concerned. The media being, you know, um, such a corporate entity themselves and closely linked to those corporate entities that are making that money from the new farm laws would have been, it, it's seen as a loss of revenue. It's seen mm -hmm. as a big setback. Okay, now Mr. Ambani is the biggest owner of media in this country. That media he doesn't does not own is the biggest advertiser. Okay, uh, it's like tomorrow if the government banned the IPL, you'd find the Indian media were totally become totally revolutionary, right? <laughs> the amount of money that rides on it. Hmm? Now you you lost the World Cup in because your players had flattened themselves out in the IPL. And I'm a cricket fanatic who loves it. I don't see the IPL as cricket. But likewise, uh, that thing is going, that it's going to be a burr in the saddle that, you know, the government went back on this. If you remember the editorials over the last year, the Express and Times would both make very sympathetic noises. You know, you meet, you've got to speak to them nicely. They're rural yokels. And the last paragraph, last lines would say, but don't withdraw the laws. They're very good. Who they are very good for was, you know, very clear to everyone, but those who need, wanted them. Um, and I mean, they were very clear, to them, you know, without, without mistake. So that was yet another problem. The fact that farmer income, that farmer income has declined in crop agriculture is another problem. So on the, they are also the media, corporate media view what has happened. They have to as a setback in the process of what they see as reforms. You know, one day we need to have a separate conversation on how the word reform has been made a Pavlovian signal for two generations now. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, for instance, when uh, when we used to, 40 years ago, when you said reform in factory reforms, labor reforms, you meant, you meant improving the working conditions of people. You meant getting women workers onto the force. You meant seeing that hazardous conditions in the factory were removed. You meant an improvement in the purchasing power and the income of the worker. Today, when you say labor reform, you simply mean the right to hire and fire at will. Yes. I think that's really worth not, it. Not every change is reform and not every reform is in the benefit of the people. Um, I think that's, it, it, and this is a really important, I'm so glad you brought this up because it's so important to clear up that we've started to, and because media and public opinion and social media is largely run by um, upper caste, upper middle class voices, this idea of ease of doing business, that the only reform we need right now is reform that makes rich richer, reform that allows businesses to expand faster, reform that allows businesses to exploit better and in a more efficient fashion. But that's not necessarily what reform is meant to do. If reform is meant to uplift the poor, to empower those who don't have voice. And for the last several couple of decades, UPA and this government, the idea has been to remove the checks and balances that protect the poor. It's absolutely right. And remember this, that, you know, the in, whether it's the UPA or NPA, the question, yeah, yesterday I was, you know, trying to explain this to, in one of the interviews, that, when everybody wants, 
you know, reform, motherhood, apple pie. I mean, these are all equivalents, you know. Everybody, you, nobody has a word against them. You can't oppose reform. Oppose reforms. Pro-corporate reform or pro-cultivated reform? Pro-factory re pro factory owner reform or pro-worker reform? That question we don't seem to ask. And we just take it for granted that it's about efficiencies, etc. And what you're saying about um, the ease of business, just take the one pandemic year. Just take the pandemic year in India, and you can look at it globally. Now, the government of India admits that the economy shrank by 7.7%. But India's $140 billionaires doubled their wealth to $600 billion, $596 billion, which is 22.7% of your GDP. Okay. Now, how in a contracting economy, 140 people took about a fourth equivalent of the wealth of a fourth of your GDP, that wasn't from growth. It wasn't from lack of ease of business, right? It came from a suction transfer from poor to rich. And you can see which sectors of the billionaires, you need to look at Forbes, you know, the, the oracle of the world's billionaires, uh, which sections benefited? Now, I think you must have had 20 programs by now. In yes. You had the problem of, docu of online education and how, how many girls do you know in this country, even in urban India, below the age of 16, who have a smartphone? Yeah. In rural areas, it's next to nothing. Millions and millions of tens of millions of girls across this country, their education is destroyed. And they're waiting for da daddy, daddy or big brother to return from the kiln on the on the weekend to download those PDFs on Papa's phone or bro brother's phone if brother chooses to share his phone. Okay. Now, in online education, the IT sector involved in online education, the tech sector, they saw gigantic profits. Health pharma, healthcare pharma, gigantic profits. In the healthcare sector, you have 24 billionaires. Did you know that? And 10 of those, the top 10 of those, added on average 5 billion rupees a day to their wealth in those 12 months. Now, please tell me, where was there no ease of business? I'm astonished at the ease with which they transferred so much wealth from the bottom to the top. And Again, when you look at it in terms of the farmers, and you see, it, it is a great victory, but it's a long and slippery slope ahead. The withdrawal of the repeal of the laws in no way, in no way indicates the, a solution to the agrarian crisis. Yes. The laws represented a severe aggra aggravation of the crisis, which the farmers have fought back. Now they've got to find the rest of it. And, you know, uh, that was going to bring, you, bring me to my next question. We had a severe agrarian crisis before these farm laws came along and made everything so much worse. Now, these farm laws will be removed. Will there be an inclination at all within this government, maybe even the next, to attempt to find a solution? Will there be an, a, a, you know, an inclination on the state government level to attempt to find a solution? Is this central government, and the Prime Minister made that promise that we would have a committee that will look into MSP. This is not a promise that we've heard for the first time. We've heard it from repeated governments over and over again. Will there, will any of this materialize in a manner that will truly uh, ease some of the distress that we have on the ground? I'll, so I'll address your question, and then I'm going to make a suggestion on what you can do next. Please. Now, why do you need a committee? In 2011, a group of a, a group of ministers committee you know, recommended made all these recommendations about MSP being made compulsory and ordered that no transaction below the minimum support price should be allowed in Indian agriculture, not just those crops, no transaction in Indian agriculture. 
the chairman of the group who signed on that report was Chief Minister Narendra Modi of Gujarat. Hmm. Hmm. It's still there on the ministry's website. Please go and see it. It's there. I'll send you the report if you like. Where Mr. Modi has uh, said we must do this and we must have fast track courts to deal with the problems of the farmer on their MSP income, etc., etc., commissions and stuff. The same Mr. Modi wants to set up another commission. See, the idea of these commissions and committees. I've had two examples. One, you know, we, you remember that famous uh, index monitoring mm -hmm. cell of the government of India on freedom of press after they ranked 142. I was a member of that committee for my sins. Do you know what happened the day I gave in a dissent note? A committee appointed on the instructions of the union cabinet secretary, the most powerful bureaucrat in the country, say the committee has disappeared. It's vanished. Since February, it's, you know, I've thought of putting out an ad saying, oh, committee, all is forgiven, come home. But, <laughs> okay, uh, nothing. RTIs are not eliciting any response about whatever happened to my committee. You know, just because I gave a note saying that your report is a lot of bullcrap. Hmm. And, uh, you know, at, look at the levels at which that commission, the index monitoring cell, after we ranked 142 in the Reporters Sans Frontiers World Press Freedom Index, that irritated the government so much because when Gora grumbles, the government gets upset. When the Gora mocks you, it, 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 you know, and they see that as mocking. So they appointed this committee. I was asked to be a member of it. Anyway, that's another story. The fact is, there was a committee under Mr. Modi on this subject of MSP and everything else. What came of it? And he has completely changed his position. There was a committee of which I was a member which has actually wandered off into the sunset and never heard of again. There was a committee appointed by the Supreme Court to study the farmers' problems. If you remember that in open court, my name was suggested for it. And I immediately issued a denial saying, I'm not part of what is going to be death by committee. Hmm. So that farmers, that fa fa the committee of uh, the Supreme Court has proved a, exactly that, death by committee. So now one more committee, actually, I'm going to propose one more committee. Okay, here's what I'm suggesting. The government committees, the Supreme Court committees have failed miserably. Where a government committee succeeded brilliantly, it has been killed like the MS Swaminathan Commission. The, that was the one commission, official body that, you know, he had the rank of cabinet minister with that, uh, of a union minister with that. Now, that one commission gave you the only thing approaching a blueprint for Indian agriculture. I didn't agree with everything it said, but I think they had put out something that was worth a national debate. Neither the UPA nor the NDA, UPA killed it first. You know, for how many? Ten years they were in power. The report lay on the table. It was never discussed in parliament. So I come around to another way of thinking now. Sixteen years have passed since the Swaminathan Commission report, first report was given. Things have happened. Climate change impact on agriculture has grown worse. Farmer, farmers' income from crop agriculture has declined. You know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to trust... Supreme Court and government commissions. I'm saying we need, and you will see that we will announce it. We've been working on it. We need not, we need a Kisan commission set up by farmers, controlled by farmers. The Swaminathan commission was a commission of experts that widely consulted farmers. The Kisan commission is a commission of people set up wow. by the farmers some of them are farmers, and they will consult experts widely. 
who better to tell you the state of in, status of indian agriculture yeah and that way you'd be able to involve every anyone in any village who wants to be part of the hearings let's have a kisan commission let the farmers of this country tell you what is then you talk about reform because they are asking for reform I, I i wanted to bring it to your attention so mr anil ghanwat who's the president of the shetkari sangathana who is a member of that uh, supreme court committee technically shetkari sangathana is a farmer um, you know uh, it, it's a farmer union he made a statement speaking to the indian express yesterday saying and i quote this is a very unfortunate decision to roll back the farm laws uh, for the farmers of the country this is a political decision the farm laws had given market freedom to farmers and agriculture product marketing this is the first time in history where indian farmers were given some freedom so he was obviously on the point of view that these farm laws were good for the farmers and yeah. that it was a bad idea okay now first of all the shetkari sangathana is a farmers union it's actually about eight or nine farmers unions from the time of sharad joshi there were multiple splits in the shetkari sangathana there are many factions claiming to be shetkari sangathana now this faction its 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 claims have never been accepted by farmers in maharashtra they in fact incited people to grow genetically modified uh, genetically modified foods crops in defiance of the uh, in defiance of the law you know that they represent a trend which you can call corporate farmer that's who they represent now if mr gunwar first of all uh, if mr gunwar was so convinced that it's bad for farmers and since he is a farmer he should have stepped across from the supreme court walked down to uh, singu or tikri or just driven down there and told his fellow farmers listen this is why you're wrong did he ever attempt to do that did mr modi whose apologies to the nation yesterday never included the fact that mr modi made seven foreign trips this year but didn't find the time to drive down the few kilometers from his residence he said he failed to pursue it wouldn't it have been a great form of persuasion if the prime minister of the country had gone to the farmers and said you know i am your prime minister you are my fellow citizens let's talk this claim of and now for instance those of us who are making this talking about kisan commission none of us i certainly do not claim to speak for the farmer i'm i claim to be a journalist who's telling you the farmers are speaking do you want yes. to listen do you, i think you should that's how i view myself okay i do not see myself as playing i think the credit people have been ringing up and congratulating me the credit for what happened yesterday lies 1 million percent with those farmers in struggle so you could mr gunwar should convince those other farmers he should go to a singu tikri speak to them and say yeah. now when he says it's against farmers which farmers is he talking about when mr modi says i failed to pursue it one section who are the other sections the other sections are mr gunwar now that committee it had two farmers including mr gunwar but it had one farmer of significance who has a standing and a following and an organization in the state of punjab who resigned from the committee before the first meeting how much faith and confidence farmers have in that committee was that they even though it came from the supreme court they said we reject your committee we are not going to talk to you these are these are nobody so like the like the word reforms who is the farmers representative you you know we keep talking about the victory of these farmers and it's it's an astounding victory because the government was not made accountable for these laws in parliament they refused to answer any questions in parliament refused to answer questions in supreme court uh 
it was only the farmers on the ground who continued to protest in the face of everything that was thrown at them, physically and also verbally, uh, that this victory came. Do you expect, and Indian agriculture is extremely complex, it's different from state to state, the issues are different from state to state. Do you expect that farmers across our country are going to look at this and say, you know what, we can stand up to this as well. So in Karnataka, in Tamil Nadu, in you know, Rajasthan, smaller pockets of farmers are going to say, let us stand our ground, let us voice our opinion, because if it could be done on the farm laws, it can be done here as well. I, I not only say you're right, I'd say that it's the inspiration does not stop at farmers. I'm saying they're an inspiration to the rest of us at a time when the media are being pounded, stupid, absurd charges. You know, they've moved from the UAPA and Siddiqui Kappan, realizing that the sedition stuff isn't going down so well. If you're picking on journalists who are better known, so then now they've moved to economic offenses, raids on news laundry, news click, all of that. So I think, in fact, what the farmers have shown us, with all the stuff done to them, they stood there without flinching. They did not retreat. They did not beg for mercy. They yes. took what the 700 of them, 600, more than 600 of them, died standing their ground. I think, by the way, uh, you know, since I'm very familiar with the camps and what happened over the year there, from your state of Maharashtra, more than 4,000, 5,000 farmers visited. At one time, there were 2,500 who went from Nashik in a karma. You'll find the stories on the People's Archive of Brutal India. Our reporters traveled with the karma, yeah? including 16-year-old village girl who's a singer and she went to sing songs all along the route and at the camps. Yeah, I, I, th I think she's an Adivasi if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So you had, you had solidarity, you know, in the assembly elections where these guys got routed, Tamil Nadu. I was sad, but you know, only in Tamil Nadu, an opinion poll, which should have been there in the question should have been there in Bengal. It should have been there in Kerala. It should have been everywhere, but they didn't ask the question. In Tamil Nadu, voters were asked by the one correct opinion poll. That opinion poll got it right, the APT, apt poll. It asked the question, not just of farmers, but of voters. Um, where do you stand vis-a-vis the farmers protesting in Delhi. Eighty-two percent of Tamil Nadu respondents said total solidarity. Okay, if they'd asked that question in Kerala, you'd have got ninety percent. So you, it's it's astonishing that that kind of solidarity has been built, and it, I think it's been somewhat built by Mr. Modi and Mr. Shah. But uh, it's you're right. It will inspire others to stand their ground rather than give up easier or earlier, but it should also inspire the rest of us. Zaina, thank you so much for speaking with me today um, and talking through this. And of course, like we have done in the past, it goes without saying that the distress on the ground for our farmers continues. Um, we have to continue to keep an eye on it. We have to continue to tell those stories. The number of suicides have not gone down. It has been aggravated by the pandemic. Uh, it has been aggravated by lockdowns. Uh, it has been aggravated by diesel prices, by fertilizer prices. Our farmers need us more now than ever before. Just like we have realized we need them. This is perhaps the best time for us to continue to focus on what our farmers need as we continue to put food that they grow on the plates of our children. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Faye.